Then I went to Trinidad, because there's a large Indian colony in Trinidad, and they believe in levitation and all that, and I wanted to see. And so this guy sat on the ground, and he meditated, and he went up in the air. And I looked underneath, and there was a hydraulic system, which he used. And I've been to thousands of seances where a guy put a, a wheel on the table with magnets, and it kept turning by itself. So I had a magnetometer near the wall, and I could sense the gadget in the wall turning that. Mm. You understand? Yes. Mm. So, that was a logical so the many seances I went to, then a guy gave me a book called Nostradamus. You ever hear of it? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So I read that book. The original French book of Nostradamus is what you want. He was always wanted by the French police for fraud. He used to polish a brass parabolic reflector and get the image from a photograph on the reflector and make it appear in the room. I don't know if you know this, but if you take a big parabolic reflector and hold your hand near it, it appears to stick out in the room. So he would take the ceased photographs of the sea people and project it into the room and get money from wealthy people. You understand? That's where not in French. The American interpretation was that guy had a lot of mystical powers. <laughs> Nostradamus said, I can tell you tomorrow's head headline without seeing it. So a lot of reporters in the old days came to Nostradamus and he had this sealed in an envelope, tomorrow's headline. And he gave it to a person and he had the person take an oath that when you read, when you hear tomorrow's headline, you say, don't add anything, but just put down say what I wrote, and don't edit it or anything else. So the guy said, okay. So the guy came and says, you know, the Germans invaded, invaded England, and whatever there was the headline. And the guy read the letter, he opened the thing, those are the exact words that are on the headlines. That's what it said. Those are the exact words of the headline. Yeah, because he promised not to edit it. <laughs> but if you don't know that, terrible thing. Now in his pocket he had a pencil and paper and he wrote the headline and he gave the report instead after the guy brought the headline in. That's in the book on Nostradamus in French. Now if you get, then a guy I met named Frank Scully, that's his real name, he wrote a book, The Secrets of the Flying Saucers. The book was called Behind the Flying Saucers. And so they, he invited me to examine the photographs of flying saucers that people took. So I don't know whether there's flying saucers or not, but I work for them. So I know a great deal about perspective and photography. So the saucers that I saw pictures of were one of this size compared to the trees in the background. Now I can analyze a photograph and say they are not real. But one photograph I couldn't. There was a three-quarter angle with three balls under the flying saucer and windows, that is, circular windows. And I looked it up, took me a while, and it was a chicken brooder from Sears and Roebuck that, that the guy photographed at an angle. So I said, so far, Frank, there's no basis for flying saucer. Then he brought about I say 30 or 40 people in his home that had actually seen flying saucers. I was to interview them. I said, what was it like inside the flying saucer? There's a lot of blinking lights and a big safety belt on the seat. Now anybody that can fly through space millions of miles doesn't need a safety belt. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, wouldn't, they wouldn't have a million blinking lights. Like if you had an instrument in your airplane, it moves instruments, and it tells you your fuel mixture is too rich, so the pilot adjusts the fuel mixture. But in the future, as the instrument hits that, the fuel mixture is adjusted. You don't need to make an adjustment. Do you understand what I'm saying? High tech in the future doesn't have dials and instruments. His projections inside the flying saucer, he said it had anti-gravity motor. I said, did? I said, yeah. I said, what was the motor like? I can pencil paper to draw it. 
So I don't know enough about motors. So I said, how do you know it's anti-gravity? He said, well, what else could it be? So I can't accept that. So every flying saucer description that I got was more like the stuff we had today. Then he says, I said, why did they come here? They came here to tap our high energy transmission lines for electrical energy. If the sun is out there with all that energy, they don't have to come here to tap your transmission line. You understand what I mean? So I said, I'm sorry, Frank Scully, I reject that. Then he says, I want you to meet Dr. G. I said, I never heard of him. He said, he worked at Wright Field and he took a flying saucer apart. And so he's the guy you really want to talk to. So this guy came in, his name, uh, he wouldn't give me his name. He just said, Dr. G. So I said, tell me about the flying saucer. He said, well, we took it apart. It landed in some Arizona. Mm -hmm. And we took it apart. I said, if you said a diamond drill couldn't drill through it, and you, no saw would cut it, it was such hard material, we didn't know what it was, how did you take it apart? He said, well, it came apart like a jigsaw. But you had to figure that out. And he worked at Wright Field during the war, he said. I was stationed in design development at Wright Field. I never saw him. So I said, I didn't know. He said, well, I came there after you left. Well, maybe he did. I don't know. So I said, do you have a piece of that flying saucer since you took it apart? He said, yes, in my car. I said, great. Would you mind bringing it in? And he brought it into the house. And it looked like Lucite to me. You know what Lucite is? Plexiglass, what they make airplane windows out of. So it looked like Lucite, but I didn't know what it was. He said, we couldn't drill it or cut it or anything. The toughest material we ever encountered. So I said to Mrs. Scully, can I use your oven? She said, of course. So I tied it in a knot.